so on, for this panel, the main theme is um, globalization. Uh, is it a dream or a delusion? Uh, why is there so much uh, anti-globalization sentiment? Uh, to frame the discussion uh, somewhat, uh, let me first uh, uh, try to draw a parallel between what is going on and uh, what was happening uh, up to uh, the end of the Second World War. As many of you may have uh, read or heard, uh, we often refer to this ongoing round of globalization as the second globalization not the first. So which one was the first? Well, the first globalization uh, was mainly in the 19th century. And uh, technically, it ended in 1914 uh, as, at the start of the First World War. But that ending process uh, continued uh, until the end of the Second World War. But then uh, we can really say that uh, the first round of globalization uh, has really come to an end. Uh, so today, of course, we're at this again. Uh, one big question uh, for all of us is why we uh, hear discussions and views uh, and explanations of the rise of uh, uh, populism and many other things. Uh, you know, we, we probably are also interested in knowing you know, how we're going to go uh, with this uh, second globalization and again also the, the rise of populism and uh, protectionism and so on, right? Some of you may wonder, you know, why I say there is a lot of uh, uh, parallel uh, uh, occurrence or, 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 or trends uh, between now and uh, the last uh, globalization. In fact, actually, I, can, I don't want to take too much time. I just want to provide the framework for our discussion. Um, you know, there is actually one book, uh, not many people know, uh, it's called, uh, the Finance, uh, it's called Finance in China. That was actually published uh, in English in Shanghai uh, back in 1913. Uh, so if you can get that book from the Hong Kong U Library, uh, there is one chapter that starts, uh, that starts uh, with a very interesting description of all the debates and concerns uh, that were happening in China and in the West and other countries about the rise of China uh, and the threat uh, due to the rise of China to the West and also the, uh, you know, a lot of uh, resentment uh, uh, and excitement as well at the same time about the first globalization. So in that book, it's, uh, it was described that uh, you know, they, uh, many people in the West uh, felt that, um, you know, the, the, the threat from China uh, was due to the, the Chinese behind the guns. Uh, uh, but this author of this uh, book was commenting probably the real threat uh, from China is not from the Chinese behind the guns, uh, but, the, uh, but the Chinese who can imitate, who can make things uh, more cheaply, uh, with a lot more manpower uh, as opposed to the uh, dear labor and uh, uh, very, uh, you know, limited uh, uh, population uh, in the West and so on. So he, in this book, uh, Wago, uh, Dr. Wago captured uh, this sentiment at that time. Of course, after the start of the First World War, uh, as you all know, you know, uh, it was followed uh, by the... Uh, uh, um, stock market crash in 1929, and then uh, the rise uh, of popular, uh, popularism and uh, protectionism in the 1930s, which did not end uh, until the end of the uh, Second World War. So in some ways, we're kind of uh, repeating some of the experience uh, during the, uh, that period, uh, starting from uh, 1914, uh, uh, and then up to where are we at in comparison? We are about in the mid the, to early 1930s. Uh, so I hope we don't con continue all the way to repeat in whatever form or shape uh, what uh, uh, then happened uh, after uh, the early 1930s all the way 
uh, to the end uh, of, the, uh, of the Second World War. Okay, so I'm not trying to scare you, but, uh, but I just want to mention that uh, while we talk about uh, popularism and uh, uh, anti-globalization sentiment, uh, it's actually uh, useful to keep this uh, in context. So on this panel, um, so after this point, I'm not going to take too much time. So I'm going to give uh, uh, most of the time uh, uh, to you in the audience, and, and in particular to the uh, three distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, first, uh, uh, I have on my right, uh, on my left is uh, William Fong, uh, Dr. William Fong. He is the uh, uh, managing uh, director of uh, Lian, uh, uh, the group, uh, managing director of Lian Fong uh, Group. Um, and then uh, further to my left is uh, Peter Matthewson, uh, whom you have uh, uh, heard uh, uh, speaking this morning. Uh, he is our uh, President and Vice Chancellor at uh, Hong Kong U. Um, AGI is very uh, grateful, and uh, you know we owe a lot to his uh, support and his efforts to make AGI really uh, uh, take off and uh, develop. And then, still further to my left is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Jaime uh, Zobel. Uh, he is the Chairman and CEO of uh, Ayala Corporation uh, in the Philippines. So we do have a, a good representation on the panel. So we're, I, I'm not going to repeat the same format. Uh, the last format was great. Uh, just to get you more excited again. Uh -huh. So let's change the format somewhat so we don't go to the podium. Um, but uh, what we can do, what we will do is to uh, have uh, each panelist uh, offer some opening remarks for up to five or six minutes, and then I will ask them uh, some questions to have some discussions uh, among us, and then I will leave all the time to, uh, uh, to you for uh, uh, more questions uh, from the audience. William? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Chen, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Professor Chen has asked me to focus on the uh, global trade aspect of globalization. You know, and uh, I will try to do that very succinctly. Uh, but most of the really great points have been made in the earlier session. But what I will do is focus on trade and, and some of the impact of populism on trade, which was discussed previously, but I'll perhaps give a little different perspective. And I'd like to uh, couch my remarks in two areas. One is the macro uh, area of trade and uh, things like uh, free trade agreements and what the governments are saying, especially President Trump is saying about that. The other one is more macro, micro, which is really the impact of technology and innovation on how the business is fundamentally changed as far as it affects trade. Okay, on the macro side, everybody's probably well aware um, the, um, the uh, benefits of trade I don't think was ever in doubt. Ever since David Ricardo and his theory of comparative advantage, it was always considered that trade would be good for everyone involved. And I think that has really proven to be the case in terms of the last uh, 50 years of, uh, of global trade. And everyone has benefited, especially in the emerging markets, as markets were opened up in the post-war Bretton Woods uh, institutions, as well as the formation of the World Trade Organization and so on. Barriers came down, uh, transportation costs came down, uh, the goods flowed more freely than ever in the last 30 years uh, through the world. And as a result, the world benefited. The, um, the developed countries benefited from uh, better price goods, which supported the consumer spending and consumer uh, lifestyle and standard of living. And then the people who manufactured the goods, you know, in the uh, distributed supply chain that my brother talked about, benefited because they now have moved from the uh, agricultural sector to the industrial sector. You know, and I think that is pretty much undisputed. What is disputed, of course, is whether the distribution was fair. What was, distributed, uh, what was disputed was whether you know, uh, certain segments of this uh, community were left out you know, in this general uplifting of the world because of global trade. And as a result of the populism that has set in, and the previous speakers talked at length about that, things like uh, the Guinea coefficient, things like people who've lost jobs, especially blue collar work, because a lot of the initial initiative of, uh, of globalization was in global trade, and that was really a uh, 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 an arbitrage in wage rates between the different countries around the world. As a result, a lot of blue-collar jobs were lost in the West, 
okay? And uh, they turn to services, and I'll say something later at the end, which is unfortunately rather bleak, you know, given what we're going to talk about today. But having said that, okay, the, um, the, the loss of blue-collar work, and, but the gain, in, I think, in the rest of the world benefited the whole world in general totally. And I, I don't think that has ever been disputed. However, because of these inequities, because of the uh, differences in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, the different countries, uh, what we saw was uh, a rise of populism in the last 10 years, maybe, maybe less, uh, about whether trade is good, global trade is good or not for any particular country. You know, in the West, it will be the people who lost their jobs saying that, you know, we shouldn't have lost their jobs. There was unfair competition. There was uh, currency manipulation and so on. These are all things that are all part of the, rep uh, the, 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 uh, the repertoire of President Trump's uh, populist uh, uh, appeal to, to the electorate in America. And uh, he got elected on that. And you know the results of that very clearly. Uh, the first thing he did, and one thing we should always remember, is that the President of the United States is probably constrained quite a lot on domestic policy because of the checks and balances we have in the US, in the US system. However, in terms of foreign policy and foreign trade, the US president probably has more power than most other heads of state anywhere in the world. As a result, the first thing he did was come out of TPP. Uh, he's renegotiating NAFTA. Uh, he's probably doing something with Chorus, this is the Korean agreement, and so on. And I think that is really the, a cause of great concern in the world, especially for people like us who are advocates of free trade around the world. Um, on the other hand, you know, on the, on the developed country side, where who does the manufacturing, there were concerns about treatment of labor, there was concern about factory safety, there was concern about use of underage and other, you know, bad labor practices, and that needs to be addressed, and, and it is being addressed, of course, right now. So there, there are different views about how, how, and of, of, of how uh, trade is now regarded, and it certainly was not in the same universal good light that it used to be in. Although I would say that on balance, I don't think it, it, it's, uh, most people would agree that international trade is good, you know, and international trade you know, should be facilitated. But one of the things that was brought up earlier is that um, the role of government in international trade. We were, we, the role of government is actually very important in terms of keeping the borders open, keeping the tariffs low, and of course the greatest facilitator of this whole process was a multilateral system under the WTO. And that, unfortunately, seems not to be working. And the reason, frankly, for that, and I'll come back to the same theme when I talk about the micro, is that things are simply not happening fast enough in terms of the regulatory environment. I think the world is moving very quickly. You've probably heard this cliche many times. There is great change, and the change is accelerating. The same is true on global trade. And change is accelerating so quickly that governments have a problem coming to a regulatory framework to be able to control it properly. And, this, and because uh, as WTO gets bigger and bigger, the size of it really means that the, the whole working of the WTO has been slowed down. So the regulatory you know, environment is a, is, a, is a concern. And I would just flag that for discussion with the group later on. Now, on the micro side, what has been discussed was technology and the advance of technology. Again, you know, as um, <coughs> Andrew Shang and uh, my, my brother talked about, you know, the, uh, the advent of the change in technology was actually given a terrific boost, really only in the last 10, 15 years, really by uh, the West's uh, reaction to the great financial crisis that happened in 07, 08. And I think the, the creation of the, the use of uh, quantitative easing to solve the problem, the, uh, the use of the printing press to put more money into the market, really created this huge war of money that has gone into the investment market also because of the low, very low interest rates that, that made other forms of investment uncompetitive. As a result, I think what, what my view is that this war of money created an environment where a lot of new technologies are tried okay, and succeeded. One of the characteristics of a lot of these new technologies is that it takes a lot of investment, initial investment, but once that investment is done, a lot of these new technologies take market share and they can ramp up exponentially and very quickly and they take over markets at zero or low marginal costs. And as a result, what you see in the world today is that these technologies are coming to maturity. Some, of course, did not, but the, the, the financial markets took that. The ones who did, and you're gonna hear from some of the people later today, 
Okay, they basically dominate the market. And I'm not so sure it's a winner takes all because behind those early incumbents are disruptors who's going to disrupt them and so on. Having said that though, what it did cause though is a tremendous change in the way we work primarily in, the, in, the, uh, in two areas. The first one is in actual manufacturing to the use of robotics and things like 3D printing have totally changed the role of labor in the manufacturing of a lot of these goods that are the, the backbone of international trade. And that caused for several things. It either is going to change the, the pattern of trade. And I don't know if uh, the newly emerging countries now, uh, one of the, one of the uh, persons in the audience talked about places like Africa and so on. They might have just missed the boat a bit because a lot of those things, the robotics and so on, is going to make the arbitrage of labor less important than it used to be in the last 30 years. Arbitraging wages was one of the main reasons why trade took off and probably one of the main reasons why China managed to rise so rapidly in the world. So uh, 3D printing still to come, but I think that's another thing we should be watching for. But perhaps more importantly, the thing, the other technology that really re revolutionized the world was the internet. And the use of, uh, and that led to e-commerce, that led to a lot of changes. And that led to really a, a more direct connection with the consumer. And what happens there is that it speeded up the whole process. As you know, we're in the process of these global supply chains, but the speed with which you need to change now is so much greater than it used to be. You know, in the old days when we engineer these global supply chains that Victor talked about, okay, the, the main concern was costs. How do you engineer the most cost-effective supply chain? Today, the main concern is speed. How do you engineer the most, the fastest supply chain that could satisfy the consumers, you know, before the consumer changes mind about what he or she would want to buy? Okay, and that speed, okay, is what's going to that led to a change in the trade patterns, including things like you know, nearshoring, what they call onshoring, which I don't think will happen, bringing production back in a lot of areas into the consuming countries. Okay, and then uh, the nearshoring, manufacturing near the country you are, just for quicker uh, delivery time and so on. But having said all that, okay, we, we're still on the old model. The change in the new model really is that, in terms of trade, is that in the old days, all the trade was from the east to the west, from the developing to the developed markets. The big markets was the, were the OECD markets, America, Europe, and so on. But what has happened, because the initial phase of globalization happened, it happened very well and so rapidly through global trade, that the, the countries that used to be involved in the production side have now developed their own middle class, their own consumption. And that's really the thing that's changing the whole world in terms of trade and the pattern of trade. The, the Chinas of this world, the Indias of this world, the Southeast Asias of this world, okay, are going to be the new consumers. They're going to account for the new middle class, the new consumers uh, going forward. And that changes the whole scene completely, including bargaining position. You know, the, the reason why the WTO succeeded in the old days was because the consuming markets were hungry for goods, the supply markets were hungry for the, for, 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 uh, for use, uh, for ba basically the supply markets were hungry for the labor that they could use to supply the consumer markets who want these labor intensive products to come from somewhere where labor is not as, uh, not as expensive. But that now is totally disrupted because now the consuming markets and the producing markets sometimes are the same, like China, for example. And I think that will change the world quite substantially. And all of this, the, one, one same, the same thing I'm going to say for both the macro and the micro environment is that speed is of the essence. Speed is what causes also regulatory breakdown. I don't think the regulatory framework under which most countries operate can change fast enough, given governance, the governance and the political systems that we have around the world, other than a pure dictatorship, can change fast enough to suit the speed with which the world of trade is changing. And I think that's the same in WTO. The complaint is that so many years now, who has five years you know, to wait while, while WTO tried to change some of the rules about, about trade? Okay, who has, you know, every same thing in the uh, domestic markets. You know, who can wait now for these technology changes to come in? And I think that, that is something that I'd just like to bring up for the audience to consider and to say how, how does a regulatory framework that, that, that uh, the failure of which have led rise to this uh, populism Okay, how can this framework be changing faster, as fast as the world is changing? And I think that, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have, which is very macro. Thank you.
thank you, uh, William. Uh, finally, I, I, I can sense that uh, we have a big supporter of the market and globalization. Uh, because my guess is uh, from the beginning of this morning uh, to at the end of the uh, uh, Asia Global Dialogue 2017, we'll probably hear a lot of uh, support, a lot more support for the G, uh, the government. Uh, but I, I take a somewhat uh, similar view as uh, William, that is uh, maybe a lot of the um, problems uh, have been more created uh, due to the distortions uh, by government interventions. So in that regard, you know, Hong Kong used to be the most loved uh, economy, free market economy by Milton Friedman. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, Friedman is, uh, is not alive anymore. But if he would actually come back here today, he would be very disappointed. Uh, just as uh, the, the bigger G uh, is played more roles uh, in the economy and, and, and society of Hong Kong. Uh, so now let's turn a little bit uh, to the educational side. Uh, if I can ask uh, uh, Peter to uh, jump in. Uh, thank you very much, Sue. So, um, yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to make some remarks in my opening uh, comments this morning about uh, globalization, and I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a fan of globalization, but the only area I really know anything about is education, so I, I know nothing about trade. You've got, you've got other people much better qualified than me to talk about trade. So. I'll talk a bit about education. Before I do that, I just wanted to make a couple of side remarks. So in Zhu's introduction, I was reminded of the, the comment by George Santayana, a philosopher, about that anyone who fails to learn the lessons of history is doomed to repeat them. Um, and uh, that statement is often attributed to Winston Churchill, but he wasn't the first one that said it. And I just hope we're not going to make that mistake when we come to thinking about globalization, that we, that we fail to learn from history. Because I think I agree with what Zhu said. We should make sure we learn from history. And I also just wanted to say, um, uh, so Zhu was kind enough to thank me, uh, as Victor did earlier on, for my support for AGI. Um, I think I've made three contributions to AGI. One was uh, to agree with Victor originally that bringing uh, FGI into the University of Hong Kong was a good idea. I think that was my first contribution. My second, I think, was um, to be rather generous to you and give you some very nice facilities in this beautiful building uh, where, where, we, where we have our meetings. But the third and one of probably the most important contribution was actually to appoint Zhu. So um, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't really introduce himself, but he's the director of AGI. Um, I, I was very pleased to recruit him from Yale just over a year ago. He started just over a year ago. Um, and, and I think he's done a great job so far. And I think the AGI's uh, uh, future is in very good hands with him. And I just wanted to make that remark. Um, Um, so, um, what is it about universities in the modern world? I wanted to just make a couple of comments about the role of universities and maybe make some contrast between Asia and um, the UK, where I spent 30 years working in universities and maybe other parts of the world. Um, the, the thing that universities are having to accept at the moment is that their role uh, has fundamentally changed. So, universities used to be primarily providers of information. So, if you wanted to learn about a subject, you would sign up to a university and you would learn from the gurus of that subject, you'd learn from textbooks, you'd learn from uh, literature. Um, you would go to universities as a way of obtaining information. And that's no longer necessary. Un information is widely available, freely available. So, the, so the, the role of a university is, is completely changed compared to what it was like prior to the internet and prior to uh, mobile technology. And you know, these are now the the primary sources of information. And the role of the university now is one much more about how to use information, how to interpret it, how to understand it, how to decide what's good information and what's bad information, what's evidence-based and what's not. What's the difference between fact and opinion? And um, I think the uh, universities need to adapt to that, to that change. I think universities are not generally agile organizations. Um, uh, you talk about bureaucracy in governments. Well, believe me, there's bureaucracy in universities as well, uh, including this one. Um, and so um, universities need to adapt. They need to accept that their role has changed in society. Um, and that includes aspects of internationalization, which I'll come back to. Um, I think the, the, the second thing is that I've never really 
subscribed to the utilitarian idea of a university being somewhere that trains people for the job market. It's never, to me, that's not what a university is about. A university is about providing education, and it's about providing personal and societal development. And it's not about training people to do particular jobs. I don't think it ever was, but it sure as hell isn't now. Because now, the jobs that our graduates do will be very difficult to predict. And many of the jobs that our current graduates do probably don't even exist yet. So uh, the, the statistic that I read recently is that the standard graduate, I think this was data from the United States, but the standard university graduate will have seven different careers uh, during his or her post-university life. Um, uh, so we have no idea what our graduates will end up doing. We have no idea which career path they'll follow. So if we think that we can prepare them somehow for a career path, we're sadly mistaken because A, they won't stick to that career path and B, the career paths that they need to be prepared for may well be something that doesn't yet exist. So um, the, the governments like, uh, especially publicly funded universities, to pay attention to the needs of the employer. And I, and I don't dispute the value of that. I think it's very important that you know, our, our graduates want to uh, uh, have employment. They, they, uh, one of the primary motivations for going to university in this part of the world or any other part of the world is the idea that going to university will equip you to get a better job, a more well-paid job, a more secure job. So that's a very powerful motivator. But universities should be thinking about equipping people with generic skills that allow them to be flexible, to be adaptable, and to be mobile. And this is what brings me to globalization. I mean, I, there was a, there's a bit of a discussion about whether globalization is, is reversible or not. Um, I, I think in terms of higher education, I, in my opinion, globalization is irreversible. Um, I don't think we're gonna go back to a situation where information is not freely available. I mean, all of us kind of looked at our phones this morning and found out what's going on in Zimbabwe. Um, you know, you, you, it, previously you'd never have had, it would have taken weeks for that information to become apparent. Now it's instantaneous. So, so the, the idea that, that we can ever go away from that technology or ever go back to the old system whereby universities were the primary providers of information, I just think is pie in the sky. And anyone that believes that I think is, is kidding themselves. So in my opinion, um, the free transfer of information and the, what goes with that is also mobility of people. I think those, those things are irreversible. Um, so what do universities have to do in order to adapt? Um, uh, one thing that I'm fond of talking about is that universities are extraordinarily resilient organizations. If you look particularly in Europe, um, but also to some extent in the United States and other parts of the world, some universities are hundreds of years old. They've survived wars, they've survived societal disorders, they've su survived recessions. Um, they, they continue to exist. And if you ask yourself why is that, um, the, the most charitable explanation is that they contribute something important to society. And so therefore they, they, they continue to exist because they're important to the, the further development of society. And I think in this period of, of extraordinary pace of change that William talked about, universities have to adapt and have to keep up. And universities are not particularly good at being nimble or being flexible or changing their mission or changing their ethos. And I think that's a major challenge. One of the um, challenges that's going on in the university world is the increased provision of online education and a drive to say, why do I need to go to a university? Why, and why do I need to go for so long? Why do I need to go for three or four years? Why can't I do it in six months or 12 months by doing it online? Um, and I think the, there's, there's almost an existential challenge to universities to counter that view. And in my opinion, the key is research. Universities are hotbeds of research. No online provider can ever mimic the research environment that a university can provide. And so universities need to be confident about what they're able to provide. They need to be um, uh, alive to the trends in the world. They need to think about what their graduates need and what, they, what the, uh, the, 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 world, the future of the world looks like. And they need to uh, adapt their, their ethos and their, and their provision uh, in order to uh, fulfill their, the, those requirements. The um, internationalization uh, in terms of what we mean at the University of Hong Kong by internationalization, we tend to think about, I mentioned this this morning, we tend to think about it as having two components. One is that every student that comes to the University of Hong Kong should have an international experience by being here. So there should be international students, there should be international staff, there should be internationally focused curricula, 
such that they're learning about important world topics, not just about topics which are regionally important, but, but about, about topics which are globally important, so that even without leaving Hong Kong, they should get a very international experience. That's the first component. The second component is to do with mobility. We believe that every student at the University of Hong Kong should spend time outside Hong Kong. And ideally, for our, we've set ourselves a target that for, for our undergraduates, 100% of our undergraduates will have two opportunities. One opportunity to spend time in mainland China, and one opportunity to spend some time somewhere else in the world. We haven't been prescriptive about what that means. It can mean, um, it can mean study, it can mean dual degrees, or, or, or study modules, or semester exchanges, or it can mean experiential learning, or it can mean working in a social uh, enterprise, or working for an NGO, or a charity, or a government. It doesn't really matter what they do, but we believe that they will benefit from working in another part of the world, learning to see things from different people's perspectives, and getting outside their comfort zone and, and living and functioning in, in some part of the world that, with which they're not previously familiar. Um, and we think that that's uh, got such educational value that we want it to be available to every one of our students. Um, and that's a pretty ambitious target, um, but we think that there's, there's genuine reasons for believing that that will make the, the graduates of Hong Kong U better equipped to cope in the, the world in which they need to succeed and flourish uh, once, they, once they leave university. So um, we are absolutely 100% committed to the internationalization of higher education. Um, I think that's important for this university. I think it's important for Hong Kong. I think it's important for Greater China and for Asia. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's an absolute uh, uh, mandatory requirement if universities are going to continue to fulfill the, the role in society that they have so far done for, for hundreds of years. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, not, just, uh, not just because uh, you introduced me so nicely, uh, but also for, uh, more importantly, for sharing with us uh, your thoughts on uh, you know, Hong Kong youth's uh, current and future plan, uh, how uh, you know, we can internationalize the uh, educational experience at Hong Kong U and also more broadly in other countries. So one important uh, missing piece that's uh, uh, not so much emphasized uh, in the ongoing debate on globalization or anti-globalization is uh, the roles played by universities and other educational institutions. So in fact, uh, if anything, educational institutions have always been uh, the biggest, uh, uh, at least one of the two biggest agents for promoting uh, globalization. Uh, the other agent is uh, business, uh, multinational corporations. Uh, you know, for, especially for China, uh, as many of you know, uh, the first um, uh, graduate, uh, uh, first Chinese graduate uh, who went to American universities uh, ever uh, was uh, uh, Rong Hong, uh, Yong Wen, uh, in, in, uh, according to the uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, spelling of uh, Yong Wen's uh, uh, Chinese name. So he graduated in, in, uh, in 1854 from Yale. It took him almost 160 days uh, to come back from New York uh, to Hong Kong. <laughs> but he played a very, very fundamental role in introducing uh, machines uh, to China. So now we say that uh, China is the world's factory and so on. The founding father of China's uh, manufacturing industry uh, is actually uh, uh, Yong Wen. Uh, we, so, so this highlights uh, the point that uh, educational institutions uh, have uh, contributed uh, greatly and uh, something that has not been as emphasized um, so now let's come back to business again. Uh, Javi, would you like to join us? Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, uh, maybe I'll just start off. Uh, uh, there's been a lot discussed in the, in the last session, and, and, and certainly uh, both William and Peter have put uh, great steps forward. So let me just respond to the issues rather than, than coming up with a thesis. But uh, maybe the start, I'm always looking to, to place the Philippines in the center of things. We, we rarely are. And uh, you mentioned that um, the globalization started uh, uh, in the 19th century in, in, in the way we see it today. 
Um, I'd like to go back a few years behind that. I was reading a, a, a small book by Peter Gordon, who used to be the editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review, now defunct. And it's a sliver of a book. I was reading it on the plane on the way here by pure coincidence. And he said that uh, his view of globalization in the Pacific uh, in particular really started uh, when uh, Magellan, as you remember, came you know, across the U.S. and then landed in the Philippines and then got killed there. And it was the start of a of a globalization movement, but he believes it really started when a navigator called Andres Durdaneta, close to 100 years later, found the route to head back to Mexico. And uh, that really started a circular uh, movement of trade with goods coming from China, moving on to the Philippines, and then moving on to Mexico and the, and the New World. And this was back in the 1500s. So in one way, you could argue that the whole movement of goods and services, of course, that were happening between Europe and India and China, but then uh, across the Pacific, it was starting as early as the, as the 1500s. And so I'd say I'm a big um, adherent to, to the globalization trends. I think it's been good for the world as a whole in, in many significant ways. And I, I tend to agree with William that from a trade point of view, um, uh, we've all benefited from it. And there's quite a bit of evidence, empirical evidence, to support it. Maybe uh, one way to add a new element to the discussion is that there's been a lot of discussion about the developed world suffering uh, under this globalization trend leading to the kind of political uh, leadership that we have now. And I'd like to look at it from the developing world's angle. Um, uh, if you look at the reports uh, in, in, in broad general terms, um, you know, one has seen tremendous progress in the world because of trade. But if you look at the developing world, uh, some of the statistics are really just so strong on how it's benefited um, uh, specific countries. Just taking China and South Korea as two examples in China, 680 million people, it's been uh, claimed, were lifted out of poverty over three decades. And in, in, in South Korea, GDP per capita moved uh, astoundingly from just $200 in 1960 to over $25,000 where it is today. Um, and so I would argue that the developing world has been a great beneficiary to a system that was encouraged by the developed world. And I think that has not been played up enough. Uh, so there's been two sides of the equation. Uh, talking a little bit about a country that I know well, obviously my country, the Philippines, it's just been tremendous to see how both uh, migration-related issues, something that, that Peter mentioned, and how services have fundamentally changed our economy. So the Philippines is seen as, a, as, as, as an economy that, that has profited a great deal from the BPO um, business, and, and that's a fact. There's about 25 billion U.S. dollars uh, generated by that service sector. What I think people haven't fully understood is they still see us as a call center uh, operator. We're not. We've become far more sophisticated than that. And with that have come a whole different set of skills that have taken our labor sector up to a whole new level. Um, I have so many anecdotal examples. I went down to a secondary city of the Philippines, Cebu, and, um, and I walked into a, uh, a, a business processing operation there, and I found myself in a room with, this is a secondary city in the Philippines, with 200 uh, individuals from a university in Cebu doing CAD CAM operations, designing uh, petrochemical facilities for the Middle East. Uh, that's just one touch point. So here is a secondary city in the Philippines doing sophisticated drawings under the leadership of a Japanese company um, uh, and, and doing intricate engineering design work for, for, for a Middle East operation. On another occasion, uh, only because we have uh, you know, real estate that obviously leases out to, to these, I have a chance to go and visit them. On another occasion, um, I won't name the bank, but uh, uh, a major US investment bank basically set up an operation in, in Makati, in Manila, and I ran into Ateneo graduates from a local school doing equity analysis um, you know, for this major bank overnight you know, to be sent back to New York through telecommunication links. And so I questioned the young man uh, in particular, and I said, you know, what exactly is it that you do as part of the equity analysis? He said, well, we have access to the data bank in New York. We work on it generally overnight based on the research that's needed. And once upon a time, we just had to gather the information and put it in a coherent way. Uh, now we do the summary, and actually the only decision we don't make is, is the buy and sell uh, part that's done in New York. And so again, this is a, a, a Filipino graduate coming out, obviously from a good university in Manila, but doing work that traditionally would have taken someone living in New York or living in London uh, or in a developed country doing that kind of work. So uh, the argument I'd like to make, aside from the service sector and globalization bringing um, uh, monetary value to a country, the skill sets that have come with it 
have also uh, taken uh, people up to, to, to a higher level in terms of sophistication. And I'm not adding there issues of medical practice, legal work, and, and many others that have elevated uh, this skill set higher. Uh, the other element, uh, which, which uh, Peter made mention of, is the issue of migration. Um, you know, migration is, uh, is, has been a, a major contributor to the Philippine economy. It was once seen, I think, as a, a source of weakness in our economy, the fact that so many Filipinos had to go and work abroad, and they were seen doing, you know, secondary or tertiary jobs in, in other countries. But I just wanted to expand on that phenomenon a little bit. I always argued more than two decades ago that this is something we should not be embarrassed about. It's part of the globalization trend. If you can move uh, areas of finance, if you can use areas of manufacturing globally, wh why, why are people not part of that equation? Or why should that be considered something to be embarrassed about? What I argued in our country is that we had to basically re-rate their skill sets and put them, uh, and, and, and basically take that skill set to a more sophisticated level and take advantage of the service economies globally. Um, the Philippine phenomenon is, is, is a tremendous one. And, uh, and uh, back in 2008, when the financial crisis hit, um, many uh, multilaterals, uh, the ADB, the World Bank, argued the Philippines would suffer tremendously during this crisis because uh, the vast majority of these migrant uh, service workers would, 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 would be basically laid off and would have to come back. You know that for the last two decades, that phenomenon has never slowed down. It's been, sometimes they say it, it is slowing down, but the growth rate continues to be there. And for some reason, Filipino service workers have hit some sweet spot globally, almost like a portfolio. We're, we're scattered just about everywhere in the world. And that has never stopped. It's continued to grow. Sometimes the growth rate has slowed down, but it's a phenomenon that's continued. And now, once upon a time, they were uh, construction workers and, 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 and house helpers. But now we have accountants, we have managers. Uh, I was talking about uh, just a couple of years ago to the ambassador from New Zealand uh, in the Philippines, and he said our whole telecommunication infrastructure is being put up by Filipino engineers in New Zealand. So just like the BPO uh, business was seen as a, as a, as a low-level business, uh, the migrant business, the service workers uh, coming out of the Philippines are now fulfilling higher and higher level jobs in, in more sophisticated industries. So I think there's more than meets the eye to these movements and in the developing world. And, um, and globalization has caused, uh, you know, many positives that, that, that have not been fully covered um, in, in, in this discussion. I think one area that, that's been of benefit is that domestic and international institutions have generally strengthened. You take a group like ASEAN, of which the Philippines is a part of. I think uh, a lot of people have said nothing much has happened with ASEAN. But as far as I'm concerned, as a Filipino citizen, I've seen our standards move up. I've seen our... Uh, ways of our legal structures, our, our, our intra-trade uh, arrangements, moving up to a level of sophistication only because we've had to conform to the standards of the surrounding countries with us. So globalization has led, I think, also to a raising of standards. Um, the one area that perhaps I'll take um, uh, a little bit of a different position uh, to Peter's is the whole issue of, of education. I would argue that globalization has led to a general uh, moving up of, of, um, of educational levels. Uh, but one area that I believe has not been given enough weight, I, I don't disagree with Peter's point of view that the role of higher education in training people uh, has to move up to a new level, and, and none of the points um, I, I disagree with. But you take a developing country like ours, and, and I use that as a proxy for other developing countries, the vast majority of students do not make it past high school, if at all. The vast majority. Very small percentage, I would say less than 10% make it up to higher education. And when you talk about tensions in society, I think that's a reality we have to face, that the vast majority in countries like ours, and, 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 and the large populations are in countries like ours, need skills coming out of high school. And that's where maybe, Peter, I'd take just a slightly different point of view. I used to, maybe I have to choose my words carefully, I used to look down a little bit at, in my younger age to technical and vocational skills. Um, as a, an experienced businessman now, and with some years under my belt, I have argued with our government that we have to take technical and vocation up to a whole new level and overweight it. It was seen as a secondary education in our country. And I take um, examples of Germany, South Korea, where they've taken those skill sets and turned them into very robust platforms for their manufacturing sector. And so the only point I'd like to make, I don't think the role of higher education should change. I think your arguments 
for uh, skill sets that involve imagination, creativity, and the like, uh, of which I'm a party of, I'm a liberal arts uh, graduate myself, uh, should be there. But there's a whole swath of society that needs skill sets coming out of high school that I believe will be well served by a strong innovation on, on, on the technical side. Um, I think globalization has also brought greater cross-cultural awareness. And uh, one area that I think hasn't been brought up in the discussions today, unless I missed it, was the issue of um, uh, the worker versus the consumer. There's been a lot of focus in the discussion today about the workers and they're being um, laid off in terms of employment and the like. But people haven't also looked at the consumption side. And, and I think William uh, began to address it a little bit with the way uh, resource allocation has taken place globally, uh, the, the points of emphasis and supply chains. And what's resulted is in, in consumption power and, 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 and consuming uh, power for, for, for the public in general coming down to a level that's unprecedented in history. Uh, if you travel now, you can goods, goods and services at, at, at far cheaper rates. And when I hear the, the protective arguments in the United States right now, I'm, I always wonder, are the consumers understanding that the moment they close their barriers, that their goods and services will go up to a whole different level? And so there's also the argument of the consumer versus the worker. And I think the consumer, under a globalized environment, has benefited uh, tremendously. Um, one, 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 one more point um, that I think was brought up by Mike Spence in, in his article in Foreign Affairs together with Fred uh, Wu and, and is, is, is the negative side of the internet. William, I think, has argued uh, very strongly uh, for the value of the internet, and I'm generally very much in agreement with that. It's fundamentally changed the way we all do business. But as one of our investments in the Philippines is in the banking sector, never in my history in banking have we spent more time on the whole issue of cybersecurity than we are now. We've had to spend inordinate amounts of sums um, uh, uh, looking at the firewalls, at the safety systems. We are buffeted, and I'm sure we're just a small bank in the global scheme of things, imagine the larger ones, we're buffeted daily by thousands of people trying to enter our system and break it up. And, um, and on going back to the negative side, and this was highlighted by Mike Spence in one of his articles, there's a whole side of the, of the internet that I think is, is becoming a new reality. Some of the more social ones we see about fake news and the like, but the whole integrity of the system is constantly under fire. And, and one big issue that I think people haven't faced up to is if you get a massive attack on your whole internet system, particularly as the internet becomes more pervasive, when do we consider it an act of war as a country? And I think the United States is, I heard Bill Gates having this discussion on, 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 on an area once upon a time. He said, you know, we haven't come to terms with the definition of what's considered an act of war in terms of, of, of cyber warfare. And when your whole utility system, telecommunication system, uh, energy is, is, is ruled by, by utilities uh, dependent on, on, on telecommunication and the like, and, and that gets massively attacked, um, it could be a new uh, area for, for, for warfare uh, to take place. Um, maybe one last point uh, before closing and allowing a discussion to take place. I think, um, again, in the developing world, there's been a, the whole issue of urbanization um, has not been given the weight it has. I think globalization has led to goods and services moving in new ways and led to a level of sophistication moving up in urban centers that's unprecedented. Um, I think uh, with, with that has come density, but with it it's become, there's also been a catalyst for innovation and change that has taken place in urban centers. A city like Greater Manila uh, basically drives 60% of the economy of, of, of the Philippines. Um, there are statistics, I was picking up one on the way here, uh, from 1997 to 2015, even a developed country like London, uh, share of Britain's gross value grew from 19 to 23%. Then you take, in our part of the world, uh, uh, the big cities, the Jakartas, the Bangkoks, the Kuala Lumpurs, and, 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 and more and more economic growth is being driven by that. I think this whole move to urbanization needs a whole new look at as well to make it effective. With it has come a combustion and a catalyst for, for innovation, uh, but the infrastructure demands have not been fully addressed by the public sector. And I think that's one area of globalization that's a massive trend that I think is positive, but I don't think we've fully addressed uh, from, from, from an infrastructure point of view. Um, uh, really, that, that's it. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it like that. Maybe one last point. Um, the role of the private sector, maybe just to add that element. I think uh, a number of speakers have talked about 
uh, a changing role that we all have. Um, I think the world has changed significantly in how they view the role in the private sector. I've always advocated, uh, ever since I came back from business school back in the 1980s, that in a developing world uh, like ours um, in, in the Southeast Asia, the role of the private sector has to move beyond the traditional metrics that, that we all learned at business school back then in the 80s uh, of you know, uh, ROEs and giving the stockholders a fair return for their investment. Our role in society has to change and, um, and, and, and our integration into solving some of the social development needs of society have to be part and parcel of how we look at it. Um, uh, our particular role as a corporation in the Philippines has changed over the last decade fundamentally. Um, I tried to find ways uh, of becoming more relevant to a country like ours and, and reaching a, a, a broader income group. That fundamentally changed my business model to go to whole lower income uh, groups and find products and services at the right price point to address their needs. That's something that started a decade ago in a country uh, like ours. I think the developed world is beginning to understand that that symbiotic role between the private sector and the developing needs, uh, development needs of the country have to come more closely together. And, um, and I think that's a changing phase of the private sector that I'm, of course, happy to talk about more as the discussion goes on. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jaime. Uh, you brought up so many interesting points and a lot of uh, great insights. In fact, I, I think uh, Peter cannot wait, uh, but want to speak uh, as urgently as possible in response. So let me turn this uh, uh, over to Peter. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I wanted to, uh, Jaime's remarks made me want to comment on two things. One is to pick up on his point about um, other parts of the educational spectrum apart from tertiary education, and, and actually you and I are in complete agreement on that point, but I didn't actually address that. Um, and then also just something I forgot to say when I was talking about it before, which was about um, some sort of contrast between Asia and the rest of the world, which uh, given my recent experience, I, I feel I'm qualified to make. So on the, um, on the issue of uh, vocational training or uh, high school skills uh, for those people that never make it into tertiary education, I completely agree. There's a really interesting debate that goes on around the world about what the optimal rate of attendance at tertiary education is. And I don't think anybody knows the answer. I mean, I was interested that you said it's 10% in the Philippines. I didn't know it was as low as that. In, in, I, was, I was at a, a leadership, a university leadership course in the United States when Barack Obama famously made a statement that the target for the United States should be 50%. And I remember asking why. You know, what, what is it about 50%? Why, why is 50% the right number? Does it mean you need to have a degree to work in McDonald's? You know, I mean, what, what, what is, you know, what, so what is, why is 50% the right number? In Hong Kong, um, coming to the government universities is about 20%, but if you look at um, uh, people who do tertiary education of some sort, whether it's an associate degree or something else, then it goes up to about 60%. So, so there's, there's no real agreement about what the optimal rate of attendance at higher education is. I don't think universities are a panacea. I don't think they provide all the answers to society's needs, but I think they've got a really critical role to play. But you're quite right that there's a whole section of society, maybe 50%, maybe even more, of young people will not go to tertiary education. So how are they going to be provided with the skills that they need to function in this, in this global world? And I agree, there's a role for schools, there's a role for families. I actually don't even think it's necessarily high schools. I think it might be primary schools, you know, maybe kindergartens, you know, maybe it may need to start very early. Um, uh, maybe by the time you get to high school, it's too late. So, so I think there's a whole separate debate there about other parts of the education spectrum, so I don't disagree with that, but I didn't, I didn't touch on it in my previous remarks. Um, and then just finally about one of, the, one of the greatest things about my job here is that I work in a society that really values education. Um, and um, that's not true in the UK. So in the UK, and you saw it with Brexit, I mean, you saw it, Brexit was a... I don't think it brought any great credit on the British electorate, the, 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 either the campaign or the result, but, the, but the, the skepticism that exists in the UK about the role of universities and indeed about the role of education is really quite powerful and really quite substantial. And I don't feel that here. I don't feel that here. The, the, the three or four biggest donors to the University of Hong Kong that I've worked with in the time that I've been here are not alumni. And in fact, they're not, many of them are not alumni of any university. Some of them didn't even have any secondary education. So, but they're people who just believe in the value of education and want to provide those opportunities for others. Everybody in Hong Kong, and I think it's probably true in many parts of Asia, 
has a sort of implicit belief in education as a route to self-improvement and societal benefit. And that's a great asset that Asia has that the rest of the world doesn't have. And I think Asia can build on that strength uh, in a way that, 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 that really perhaps at the moment hasn't been as em emphasized as much as it should. Uh, thank you, Peter. I, I, um, I would like to uh, use uh, uh, this, the remaining 15 minutes uh, in the most efficient way. Huh? Let me ask a couple of questions, and then I will turn it over to the audience. Uh, first, uh, Jaime, um, we brought up the point about the private sector or, or the cooperation uh, in today's uh, world. Uh, this morning, you know, I saw, that, uh, I saw in the news that uh, Tencent's market capitalization just uh, exceeded 500 billion US dollars. So Tencent has joined this uh, small club uh, of uh, 500 billion or more uh, market capitalization companies. Um, so in comparison, there are only so many uh, countries, I think uh, there are about 25 countries in the world today whose GDP is higher than 500 billion US dollars. So if I have to compare the corporation versus uh, uh, nation state governments, uh, who is more powerful and more influential uh, in today's world? I, I can see, of course, a lot of uh, strength, a lot of power, especially under Trump uh, for the uh, White House. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, nation state governments cannot easily uh, cross the border and uh, engage in investments and many other things uh, in various uh, foreign countries. Whereas corporations uh, are much more free. Uh, they can go anywhere. So this is why today, you know, um, uh, the corporation, uh, so to speak, uh, plays such a very, very important, uh, even more dominating role than most uh, governments uh, in the world. Uh, so that may uh, put more pressure on the private sector or on a modern corporation. Uh, but then how do you think uh, the corporation should really respond to uh, the calls from the larger society uh, to, for, for the corporation to do more in order to address uh, some of the uh, anti-globalization sentiment? Um, I, I think there are many ways to look at it, and it depends also on the leadership of the institutions. I, I think in a developing country like ours, I've always felt that uh, private institutions have an inordinate ability to access capital, the best talent, and the best partners to, to address any solution. And with that comes a, a special responsibility. Not everybody agrees with this point of view, by the way. But I've always felt that if we don't build trust in new ways, and this started decades ago, and it's interesting to see the developed world going through that thinking now, when in the developing world, I was acutely aware as a CEO about this uh, tension that existed in our society because of the inherent inequities that take place. But uh, the way we use it, for example, uh, right now, and there are many different ways of, of handling it, is it, it follows a little bit, you know, some of the ideas like shared value concept developed by Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School and, and other ideas of, 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 of melding a little bit the, the for-profit model to some of the developmental needs. One area, uh, that, again, around the field of education that we've decided to put some capital into, we have a, a fairly structured system, and going back to my argument that the vast majority of Filipinos leave high school without any skill sets, uh, we've decided to put, for example, some private capital into the educational system and put up our own high schools. Um, uh, I decided to take a very different point of view. Uh, the Department of Education, after much cajoling, allowed us to start this process. We only teach English, uh, so my, my focus is on, is on bridging the education employment gap. That's not the only uh, educational uh, uh, um, uh, point of view that one wants to hit, but we just decided to have a very particular product to address some needs in the Philippines. So we only teach English, which is not the usual pattern in, in, the, in the primary and secondary system. And in the last year of the curriculum of these schools we're setting up, we now have about 30,000 students under our system. We specifically go to a bridging of the educational um, employment gap by giving them specific skill sets for the job straight out of high school. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that involves a lot of work with computers, a lot of work with simulations on sales, uh, very unusual. And we took a, a pilot program at the beginning, and 
and took some very average students, didn't take special students, put them through that system, and put them through traditional high school, public high school in the Philippines, and the, 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 the percentage of, of, of employment statistics on the one that went through the specialized system and, and their ability to get hired moved up by a factor of, of three or four. It was tremendous. So we decided to put capital behind that system just to address the needs of a country like ours. But there's so many uh, other examples. Uh, thank you, thank you. Let me ask uh, my second question. Um, which is related to what was uh, uh, discussed in the previous session, that is, em is uh, employment uh, the only reason for, uh, you know, popular, for the rise of uh, populism? Uh, in some ways, uh, probably I agree that, uh, you know, not all of it, definitely not all of it, it's due to employment. Uh, when, when we look at the fact that, uh, um, you know, we are here at the uh, AGD, and uh, how many people actually can come here and speak or attend uh, this event? Uh, not too many, right? So, so this uh, winner-take-all sort of phenomena uh, has been universally uh, uh, growing uh, in almost every profession, including in, among speakers uh, for, I mean, at big events. Because I remember, you know, when I was um, growing up in the 80s, probably all the local communities would have their own uh, most uh, famous, uh, you know, most sought after speakers. Uh, but today, uh, a few Americans and, and Europeans, maybe a Hong Kong elites, uh, dominate most of the uh, speaking opportunities. Uh, you know, in, in, in Asia and, and other countries. So this is why the discontent uh, with globalization comes uh, from many different uh, reasons, uh, which has made it really difficult uh, for us to understand, because on the one hand, one way or another, almost everyone has benefited from globalization. Uh, on the other hand, almost everyone has something to complain uh, about globalization. So. So, William, what, what, what do you think are the uh, reasons behind this? Uh, are we humans, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, not well endowed enough to be able to assess uh, the positives and negatives uh, of globalization? I, I, I've noticed that uh, in the media, right, when you write a story, a very personalized uh, story about someone whose family really suffered, uh, from globalization, and then, you know, such articles get much uh, more attention. Whereas if you talk about uh, how uh, uh, many great contributions uh, Li and Fong has made uh, to this uh, globalized uh, world, uh, many people will say, yeah, okay, it's interesting, but I have more interesting articles to read. So that has created this uh, very big asymmetry uh, in terms of uh, our uh, processing and appreciation or understanding uh, of the positive aspects versus the negative aspects of globalization. So what can we do to change this? Of course, education is one solution, but anything else? Well, you know, I think you're right, uh, Professor Chen, in terms of saying that uh, there are obviously very good statistics to prove that uh, globalization and global trade is beneficial you know, to everyone, both importing, exporting countries and processing countries. However, I think uh, the, there are problems because uh, there are inequities within who gets the jobs, who loses the jobs, and so on. And, and I think the government really has to uh, have a system to uh, retrain. I think uh, Victor talked about that. It's a huge job of retraining those whose job has been made obsolete by globalization. Uh, but the same thing will happen later. It's not just globalization. I think one of the things I like to put down now or put a marker down is that if you look at the next revolution coming, which is the whole AI revolution, you know, you're talking about perhaps a great, much greater disintermediation of existing jobs. And, and so I think this whole idea of the, the society is constantly in a state of flux and preparing your population okay, to accept the fact that life is changing and they have to change is very important. You know, my, my own thinking is that, uh, is that the universities have a lot to do with that. You know, I think uh, Peter touched on it, you know, Jaime touched on it. The idea that, uh, you know, that 
a, a job is only a, a part. I think uh, I think you said somebody said that uh, in, in a in a you said I think Peter that in the career of a graduate after after university there are at least five or six changes after that. So I think the ability to cope with change is probably something that we need to uh, educate our, our people about because there will be change and tremendous change. I'm also of the school that does not believe you hold back progress you know, in technology and other areas, you know, in order to uh, make it easier for people to adapt to change. But it's also true. People just cannot adapt to change that quickly. And I actually think that people are actually more flexible than institutions. So the whole idea of governments, governments uh, adapting to change is actually very, uh, by, the, by the very word bureaucracy, of the, you know, this is a lot of bureaucrat, bureaucrat that it seems to be inherent, that word is the uh, resistance to change. And, and yet we live in a world where change is, is, is uh, all around us and is accelerating. So, so my, my thinking is that, uh, is that corporations have to change. I think Jaime gave a very good example is how the corporate world changes. I mean, we were brought up on uh, Adam Smith and the theories of, uh, of uh, competition. And the idea is that you just concentrate on making money and the rest of the society take care of itself. That's obviously change. I think the, the role of a, of a corporation as a good citizen within the society and the community they operate in is now uh, is, is, uh, is a key part of uh, the existence of a corporation. You know, you're not just there to make money for your shareholders. You look at all your constituents, all your stakeholders, and you've got to think about how you take care of all your stakeholders. And I think, uh, and, and I think the market itself, if left to its own devices, uh, takes care of it. You know, a lot of malpractice at the corporate sector sector is sanctioned by consumers, by customers, and sanctioned by their workers. You know, so you, you don't have a free reign, you know, what to do. But the government obviously plays a very good role, a, a very big role in terms of setting the rules and the boundaries within which, which corporations and societies function. And I think, unfortunately, I think that is part is failing in, in, many, in many areas, many societies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, William. So Hope just... Uh, is reminding me that we have five minutes left. So sorry, I'm not doing a good job managing the time. Uh, but uh, let me open it up now for questions. Yeah, here. And this is more for Jaime. You said that you, your schools, 30,000 students, but you insist on English. Is, is that a, a dissonance between what Corporations are demanding and what the government is providing and do you see that in other countries as well? Yeah, yeah I, I, I have no um, uh, Just to make it clear. I have no issue with, with with the way the Philippine government is running the educational system. They have needs We're a disparate country uh, actually uh, uh, Filipino is a national language, but we have uh, you know uh, a, a number of maybe ten local dialects and 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 there's a complex system of integrating these dialects into the educational system and the like. However, I have always felt that here we are as a country where $25 billion of remittances drive our economy in a significant way. And the skill set for the overseas uh, service worker is, is English. And, uh, and we've gotten a lot weaker as a country in, in, in doing it. And a lot of these are, 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 are students leaving high school and then seeking employment. So I thought by setting up these schools, it's just a particular point of view, really preparing a group of students, uh, usually not from any, you know, from lower to middle income families and preparing them for the workforce to get them employment. I mean, we have a population of 110 million people in the Philippines right now. And so we put up a system where English, we felt, was just a way to give them a global skill, a skill that's naturally there but has been losing um, a point of focus for nationalist reasons and the like. So. We gave them that to prepare them for the workforce uh, that could be global in nature. Um, and so that was the focus of that particular skill set. Just a very particular degree that they're getting from a high school with a set of skills that at least enable them to get a leg up in a global environment. Thank you. Uh, Ingrid? I would like to ask, um, maybe for, for William, uh, which Chinese companies, the mainland Chinese companies, are truly considered to be global? Would you say Alibaba or Tencent, are they really global companies? Or are they facing a lot of headwinds going global because of all the regulations from, from overseas? Well, I think um, every global company has a uh, home market 
where they first have to prove their worth and, uh, be, be, and, and basically where, the, where they establish their reputation before they can actually move abroad. China being a very young economy from the point of view of uh, Deng Xiaoping's opening up from 1979 onwards is fairly, a fairly young economy. I think the, uh, they already have an in, inordinate number of companies that are potentially global companies. I think there are, there are many companies in China that are potentially global companies. And I think it's also helped by the fact that a lot of the initial impetus, I know now we talk about the domestic market, and about Alibaba and so on, but don't forget the original impetus of the China's growth as the factory of the world, as Professor Chen said, was to export to countries overseas. As a result, the Chinese economy, as far as the manufacturing side is concerned, is already hardwired into a lot of overseas economies and markets. So the conditions for them to go global is actually better than a lot of other countries you know, who, who are depending on just the domestic market. However, having said that, China does have the largest domestic market in the world in terms of headcount and probably in terms of size as well. There was always two promises of China, right? The first one is to be the uh, factory of the world. The second is to be the world's largest consumer market. And I think you're seeing China realizing both of these promises. Um, in the interest of time, uh let me take one, uh, let's take one more question, and then we'll, we'll end, okay. Anyone would like to uh, ask the last question? Yeah, I'll, I, okay, I guess uh, you're all hungry for lunch. Uh, um, so you can see globalization is uh, it's such a great thing, it's a great force as well. Uh, we could stay here to have um, different uh, takes on positives and negatives uh, from globalization because globalization has affected uh, not just uh, different economies, different societies, uh, but uh, many, many, many millions of individuals. Uh, so for that, I, I think uh, while we think uh, there are a lot of negative consequences, uh, you know, globalization is still great. In particular, where we're sitting, you know, that is Hong Kong. Uh, there would not be Hong Kong uh, without uh, globalization. So this is uh, uh, as uh, clear and tangible a piece of evidence as uh, we can get uh, anywhere. So with that, uh, let's uh, thank the uh, great panelists um, for their insights. Yeah, thank you.